Okay, well, y'all look great this morning. Now, I want to tell you something. You do. And some of y'all, one of you need help. No, no, no. There's, the rest of y'all look great. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Uh, anyway, anyway, I just sing it. But, uh, hey, listen, it, it's good to see everyone. And uh, I, I was, I, look, this is, I'd like to say it's a true story. I doubt it. But anyway, so a man placed an ad in a local affairs website. Here's what it said. I have two Super Bowl tickets, uh, which I paid two hundred and fifty thousand, uh, two hundred. I mean, twenty five hundred dollars for each ticket. They're box seats, but I didn't realize it last year that when I bought them, I was going to be married on the same day as the Super Bowl. I am looking for someone to take my place. The wedding is at St. Thomas Church, Providence, at three p.m. Her name is Amanda. She's five six, one hundred thirty. She'll be the one in the white dress. Can you imagine? Anyway. Now, I know what you're thinking. <clears throat> Who do we pull for? I pull for the Cowboys. They hadn't been anywhere in any long time. So, do they still have a football team? That's a long time ago. I mean, I used to live there. I mean, you know, I guess in my formative years. But, hey, uh, we're, we're in Nehemiah chapter uh, 8. And, um... We're, we're, we're in verses seven and eight, and look, um, what what we're going to see is is a time of transition. Okay, now look, we we've looked at Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah was was a book about rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, and we looked at everything the the um, the walls represented to the people: strength, honor, prosperity, and and because they had no walls, they, they had no way to protect themselves from their enemy. Okay, and they were vulnerable, and much like look, sometimes we need to rebuild things in our lives. Amen. Right? I mean, think about this. I mean, sometimes we need to rebuild our self-image, or maybe we need a a job, or maybe we had to rebuild our marriage. I mean, things like I mean, so, and sometimes you know, we had to rebuild a relationship. I mean, and, and we and if you don't, if you haven't had to do it, you're going to have to one day. And so what we saw uh, and what we've seen is here was a man named Nehemiah, okay? And, and Nehemiah was a slave because the people of Israel had been carried off into captivity to Persia, right? And uh, Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. And Nehemiah heard about everything going on in Judah, uh, which was the country, and he asked specifically about Jerusalem, and the walls were in disrepair, and the people weren't doing that great. And the Bible tells us that Nehemiah heard the news and he was so taken by it that he wept. Now, think about this. Nehemiah had never been to Jerusalem as far as we know. Yet, and we looked and we saw as a part of his prayer, he confessed the sins that he had committed. He hadn't been there. He'd done nothing as far as we know. Yet, he was so impressed with the need and, and so impressed with the opportunity to go that he prayed. And remember, he asked favor, uh, and the king gave him favor to go. He asked the king for protection. The king gave protection. He asked the king for um, you know, um, access to the, uh, to, to the wood in the forest, and the king gave him access to the wood in the forest. And he went back to Jerusalem. It had been over 300 years his walls had been devastated. And here was Nehemiah that came to a group of people. The Bible says the first thing he did was he went out and checked it out. And the next thing he did is he identified with the people. He said, we've got to rebuild these walls. He said, I'm here to help you. And he asked for the people's help. And you know what? They helped him. The Bible tells us also that everybody wasn't pleased. Well, he was criticized, and we learned how to handle criticism and opposition a few weeks ago. And, you know, we, we saw that um, as the people, you know, begin to complete the walls, um, the people got excited. And last week we saw that, you know what, 52, the Bible tells us 52 Days. And, and the walls were completed. 52 days. 
for a project that many thought was impossible, for a project that many thought would never happen. Nehemiah was a great leader. He was able to motivate the people. But in the midst of all of that, Nehemiah never forgot to pray and ask for God's help. And so what we see now is a time of transition. Because no longer are we going to focus on the walls. They've been rebuilt. But we're going to focus on the lives of the people. Because, you see, it's one thing to rebuild the walls. It's something else to rebuild something in their lives, right? You see, walls in some ways are easy. People are harder. Would you agree with that? I mean, really. Look, walls are external. They're visible. People can hide things. Rebuilding a person's life is a matter of the heart. And and the heart, the Bible tells us, is is wicked. And and no one can know the heart, right? I mean, look, I'm glad we have a God who looks beyond all my stuff and all my junk and loves me anyway. But but Nehemiah knew that that he was going to have to shift gears Now, remember, last time we saw that Nehemiah had been appointed governor of the country of Judah by the king. He was a cupbearer. He was a construction worker, a construction leader. He had been appointed governor. And uh, Nehemiah Nehemiah began to give it away. Now, look, let me tell you something. Folks, just because a person leads us to A doesn't mean he's going to lead us to B. Do you understand that? I mean... Moses led the people to the shore of the river. It was Joshua who led them into the promised land. Mo- Moses took them so far. But Joshua took them the rest of the way. And it's amazing how different gifts and talents and abilities we have. And folks, we don't have to. There's, there's not a person in the world that's indisposable. You understand that? None of us are. God will use us, but there is a time and a place to step aside and let God use someone else. And and you know what? Nehemiah wasn't concerned because throughout it all, Nehemiah was concerned that God got the credit. Now, let's, let's notice what Nehemiah did. The first thing that we see about Nehemiah as he, as he started to uh, make that transition is that he enlisted and he empowered other people. The Bible tells us that uh, in verse 2 of chapter 7, that um, I put in charge of Jerusalem, the city, my brother Hanani, because um, he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most men do. So, look, Nehemiah couldn't do it all. And he was wise enough to act as governor of a country, but but he let his brother, and notice a qualification, he was a man of integrity, and you know the word integrity means to be a whole person, an integer in, in, in math uh, is, is a whole number, right, and and that's what integrity is, it's simply a whole person, and and, and he was, you know, he feared God, he, he was faithful, he feared, he feared God more than most men, and those were the only two qualifications that Nehemiah was looking for. And he put him in charge. You know what Proverbs 9, uh, 11, 20 says. I give you that verse. Um, well, the, the Lord hates people with twisted hearts, but he delights in those who have integrity. Hey, I'm going to tell you something. People with integrity. Those are the people I want to hang around. And I want to be that person of integrity. Who, who doesn't say one thing but then does something else, but who says one thing and doesn't. Oh, oh we, we, we can hide it and pretend that nobody knows, but it's going to come out. And can I say this? God knows. And you know what else? We know. You know what else Nehemiah did? He gave the people responsibility. Chapter 3 of verse 7. He said, I, I, I said to them, 
appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards. Look, the people rebuilt the walls. Who, who better to take care of the walls that rebuilt than the people that built them? Look, just because Nehemiah, just because the wall were rebuilt doesn't mean that the, the opposition ceased. You understand that. But there were people who didn't want them to succeed. And the people should guard. They, they took personal responsibility for, for what was going on. And, and Nehemiah gave it. He, he let the people do it. You know what else he did? Um, he, he shared his, what he shared with Ezra. The Bible says that Ezra was gifted and prepared to teach. They told Ezra, look, um, look, look at verse uh, 11, uh, verse 1 of chapter 8. They um, said, Ezra, um, the scribe, bring out the book of the law, which the Lord had commanded. Um, <laughs> look, Ezra was, he, he knew more of the, of the book of the law. He, he knew more than, than Nehemiah did. He was skilled. He was um, good at it. And so the Bible says that Nehemiah gathered the people. And he said, you know, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have Ezra. And Ezra is going to, well, he's going to bring the book of the law out. Now, can I tell you this? Folks, in, in that culture, in that day and time, they, they didn't have all the Bibles that we do. They, they didn't have the apps on their phones. But there are some people that might not have even known the law. But there are some people who, not, who might not have been familiar with, with what was written. He had Ezra come and stand before the people and said, you know, Ezra, look, you're, you're going to share with them. And, and you know what else they did? He made sure... That when they rebuilt the people, that they rebuilt them on a solid foundation. He rebuilt the culture on a foundation that wouldn't shift. Ne Nehemiah was, was careful. He, he, he understood that people have a tendency to push it. <laughs> people need guidelines. Do we need guidelines? Hey, anytime you don't think you need a guideline, get on the interstate. Okay, and I'm serious. I'm serious. Anytime you don't think you need guidelines, just get on the interstate and go. Okay, you're, you're smiling. You know exactly what I'm talking about. I need those things. And thank the Lord for cruise control. Right? Or, or, or a girlfriend or a wife at the backseat driver. But that's another story. Now, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, I'll give that verse to you. Um, and um, the things you've heard. From me, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust the faithful men who will be able to teach others. Now, Nehemiah knew these things, I'm sure, but he entrusted Ezra. Paul wrote Timothy in 2 Timothy. Timothy, don't, don't keep this to yourself. Give it to faithful men who are going to be able to teach others. And you see, folks, there's something that happens when we start reading the Word. The Word, the word starts to change our life. Amen? Or it should. And, and we start to choose our priorities. And, and we start, maybe we hear things that we've long forgotten. Maybe we hear something that we haven't heard before. But the Bible tells us that they reestablished and, and they reestablished their culture on God's truth. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed and, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. I have given you Isaiah 48. This, this is a great verse, by the way. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of the God, the word of God stands forever. Folks, as beautiful as nature is, it, it comes and goes, it changes. But the word of God stands forever. But we have to build on something that's going to last. We have to build our lives on something that's not going to change. That's not dependent upon outward circumstances. That, that's not dependent upon a Congress or a president. That's not dependent upon anything. We, we don't know. We, we have to build our lives on something that isn't dependent on living in Orlando because none of us know if we're going to be here a year from now. 
We don't know what we plan. We should plan, but we don't know for sure. We can think. And folks, none of us know if we're going to be here tomorrow. Can I say that? We don't want to know. We think we are. We hope we are. But we don't know for sure. And anybody that says, oh, I know for sure. No, you don't. You don't. You don't. But it's okay. I hope you are. Now, what do they do? And folks, this is the process. The first thing they did is Ezra came out. And you know what he did first? He read the law. Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon. He just read it. Folks, there's, there's something to be said about reading the word. <laughs> I mean, it's there. There's something that happens. Now, it does help, I think, to pray God give me insight into your word before we read the word. But, folks, the, the word, well, we're going to look and see, but the first step is reading the word. Maybe, maybe the people hadn't heard of it. They, they didn't know the laws. We'll see in just a moment that they introduced and they reinstituted some feasts that they didn't know about. You know what else they did? They listened to God's word. All the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Listened attentively. They didn't just hear it, but they listened. And there's a difference, by the way. There's all kinds of sounds in the world, but what do we listen to? Who do we listen to? What are the qualities we look for in the people that we listen to? Who has impact on our lives? The Bible says that the people actually listened to what Nehemiah, or I'm sorry, what Ezra was reading. You know what else? I'll give you this verse from Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from hearing. Faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is found, or the message is heard through the word of Christ. Hey, can I tell you something? If you want to grow in your faith, there's only one way to grow that I know. It's to read the word. Uh, one of the questions I used to get asked all the time when I was serving as a full-time pastor is, Pastor, how do I grow in my faith? And I, I tell people, look, you've got to get in the word. And, 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 you know, it's great to be in the word in groups, but you've got to get in the word individually. You're going to spend time in the Word. It grows us. Why? Because it was written for you and for me. Hey, can I say this? The Word of God, the Bible, 66 books, most of it was written to believers. The, the Word tells us a lot about God, and the Word tells us a lot about ourselves. When I, now, when I say God, the Word tells us a lot about God. I'm, I'm talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You, you understand. The, the Bible says a lot about that. But the Bible says a lot about me. It has insights into life. You know, it just seems to me that I, there's some parts I wish weren't, weren't that weren't written, that weren't there. Because when I read them, it's just talking about me. And some of the parts aren't good when it's talking about me. But, but they're there for a benefit. They're there for a reason. They're there for a purpose. And all of this is to change me, to draw me closer to God. Look, I have to respect the word. The Bible says that the people all stood up. And all the people um, lifted their hands and responded. Why? They, lift, they lifted their hands out of respect. They, they knew there was something special. It, it just wasn't trite. Th these words weren't any words. They, they were the word of God himself. Now look. Folks, I, I can't do a whole lot to convince you about the word. But but the word of God is do you understand that the word of God has stood the test of time. I, I, look, the word of God has the power to change a person's life. It, it does. I, I don't know what else does, but it does. And I need to understand that. I need to respect that. And, and the people did. You know what else they did? They responded to God's word. They responded. The, the people, um, I'm sorry, the, the next thing they did is they understood the word. 
They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear um, and, and giving um, the meaning so, so that the people could understand what was being said. Folks, look, we all need to understand the word. We all need to understand what was being said. Look, I could sit up here and impress you with big theological words. For what? They do no good. I've got a PhD in theology. I know all of them. I know them in Latin. I know them in English. I know some in German. I know some in French. I do. But they don't mean a thing in the world. Hey, you know, you know, Karl Barth. Karl Barth was was a great German theologian. And he, he wrote the Church Dogmatics. And I promise you, you put all the volumes together of the Church Dogmatics, they're like this. And he was asked one time, what, 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 what have you learned? And he said, you know, what I've learned is that Jesus loves me. This I know, where the Bible tells me so. Pretty good, right? Kind of cuts through it all. If, if, I could, if I can convince you of one thing. Folks, we, we need to understand the word. That, that's why we have preaching, and that, that's why we have teachers, and that's why we have commentaries, and that's why there are different translations. And look, can I say this to you in love? Look, folks, when you talk to God or when you read the Bible, you don't, it doesn't have to be thou and thee and inasmuch and wherefore and. Do you, you understand that? God, we thank thee. Well, God wants to hear from the heart. He, he wants to hear from you. There, there, you. You don't have to learn the language of Zion to talk to God. Hey, you have to talk to him with your heart. That's all he cares about. Hey, he wants to hear from you. It's hey, not that stuff. Not that, not that junk. You, you know what else the people did? They, they responded to the word of God. The Bible tells us, look at verse 9. All the people were weeping as they listened to the word of God. Why, why were they weeping? You know why they were weeping? Because they realized they were guilty. That's why. That they realized they had blown it. That they realized they had ignored the word. They had not kept the word. Can I ask you a question? Huh. What, what do we do? Have, have we ever been moved to the point of tears when we recognize that we haven't kept the word. And can I say this? There's, there's a place for that. But but you know what God's job is? God forgives and forgets. Did, did you hear that? God forgives and forgets. Oh, well, I know a lot of people that forgive, but they don't forget. No, no, no. God does both. And there's a place for true guilt. Then there's something else that we struggle with, or at least I do. It's false guilt. You know what false guilt is? Something we've done in the past comes up. And, and you know what? We've already talked to God, and he's forgiven us. We've already talked to a person we've offended, and they've forgiven us. But you know what happens? The enemy, the enemy, Satan, brings it to mind. And what do we start feeling like when we have that kind of false guilt? Loser. Loser. You're not a good Christian. <laughs> no, listen. God says he loves you. God says you're his beloved child. You're his son. You're his daughter. You're a joint heir with Jesus. See, there's a place for... Well, true guilt, there's no place for false guilt. Well, grace and joy, instead of guilt, uh, do, do not grieve, the Bible says, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Verse 10, Nehemiah 9. Look, God, God doesn't want us to grieve. Can I tell you that? There's, there's a place for it. There's a time for it. But, but you know what God wants in, instead? He wants joy. He wants peace. He does. Hey, and, and you know what? He wants Christians to be like that too. 
He, he doesn't want Christians to be sour. Have you ever any sour Christians? I don't want to be around sour Christians. Folks, they want everybody to have a bad day. I don't want to have a bad day. I don't want to have a good day. Um, you, you know what else they did? The people looked that get on a row here, but they re, they reordered their lives according to the word. Look at verse twelve. They were well, well, well. They now understood the words that had been made known to them. They they understood what was being said, and, and they reordered their life, and they reordered their culture according to the words. Now, folks, it doesn't do any good to read and to understand and to listen if, if we don't apply them, right? It, it, look, we, we, we have to take it to that point of application. We have to reorder our lives based on something. It could be how we feel. It could be what I think. It could be what somebody else thinks. Or you know what? It could be what God says. Because he'll, he'll never disappoint. I can tell you that. He'll never slow us down. He'll never lead us astray. I'll tell you that. It really is up to us. You know what else? The Bible says they receive continual joy as they continually follow God's word. Verses 16 and 17 of Nehemiah chapter 8. So the people went out and brought branches and built themselves booze at the, the out on their roofs and, and there was joy and it was very great <laughs> now look specifically in this in this context it's talking about the theme the the, the, the feast of booze or tabernacles that, that's what it's talking about and we'll look a little bit about that, that and, and you know what they didn't celebrate it I mean, why celebrate? <laughs> the walls are not built. They might not have even known about it. But the Bible says they celebrated it. And, and they had great joy. See, look, it's one thing not to know. It's something else to know and not do it. And, 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 and folks, for, for us, it, it's knowing and not doing it which is, I think it's our big, and it's my biggest challenge. And I suspect it's many of your big challenge. If I don't know something, okay. But if someone tells me something or points it out to me, or God reveals it in his word, that's another story. If I want joy, God's joy, it's because I'm applying it in my life. And the Bible says joy, peace. Hey, Joy. Now, happiness? Yeah. But you know what I found? Happiness is based on circumstances. Happiness comes and goes. Happiness is something that happens. Happiness is based on my emotions. But joy, it's something in my gut that tells me no matter what happens on the outside, everything's going to be okay because God has got this. And he's got me. And I have that in my gut. Not based on any promises, but based on the promises of his word. Nehemiah understood that. The walls, one thing. The people, something else. Can I ask you a question this morning? What, what, what are we building our lives on? Are we building our lives on the Word of God? I, I hope so. I hope so. Hey, who are you impacting? You know, Neon my impacted a whole generation, a whole culture. Who are we impacting? It's just one person. That's one person. That's fine. Who is it? You say, well, there's nobody. Pray. Can you, will you pray about that? Ask God to bring someone and then impact them. But what are you going to impact them with? The word. And can I say this to you in love? Folks, don't beat them over the head. Don't say turn or burn. 
even though some people need to burn. <laughs> I, shouldn't, I shouldn't say that. But but don't 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 beat them over the head. Don't don't criticize, find fault. Love them anyway. Okay, love them anyway. In the same way that God loves you, anyway. Okay, meet meet him with his love and meet him with his grace. And uh, you know what? We're gonna have joy, and, and the world that we live in is gonna be a better place. And, and we're gonna follow the example of Nehemiah, and we're gonna have a lasting influence, as he did. You want that kind of influence? Let's talk to God. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much. For